All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jillian. I'm a senior product researcher at Intercom. So before I get started, I'm just curious, how many of you have actually heard of Jobs to be Done? OK. It's more than I expected. All right. So I'm going to talk to you about what the technique is um, and how you guys can use it in software development. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in a really traditional family. I had a dad that was a doctor and a mom that was a stay-at-home mom. So I had really little exposure to the world of innovation. Um, it wasn't until I became an avid runner, actually, that I learned the story of Bill Bowerman, the founder of Blue Ribbon Sports, a company that would later come to be known as Nike. Uh, so before Bowerman actually founded Blue Ribbon Sports, he was a track and cross-country coach at University of Oregon. And he would do literally anything he could to help his team run faster. Um, as a distance coach, he knew that every ounce that his runners carried uh, made a huge difference. So he looked at what they were wearing and saw an opportunity to strip some weight in their shoes. So he actually got out his very own waffle iron and made the very first lightweight waffle sold shoe for his runners to use. And it actually worked. His team could run faster in these shoes and long distances. Um, and this story of Bill Bowerman literally inventing shoes left me in awe. So much so that I decided that rather than follow in my father's footsteps and pursue a career in medicine, I was going to become an inventor. I wanted to make innovative products that could have a huge impact on the people that use them. So I decided that I would actually follow in Bill Bowerman's footsteps and pursue a career in industrial design at University of Oregon. So really early on in my studies, I learned that if I wanted to make an innovative product, uh, research was going to be essential. So great products, I noticed, had a clear vision, and that vision was often fueled by research. Research could tell you why a product existed, how it was similar or different to other products, and most importantly, it could help fuel your development process, and it could make sure that whether you're iterating on an old feature or creating one from scratch, that whatever you were making was going to be innovative. So, I started out my career as a designer, and I was the number one advocate for research. So much so that um, when I was working at a consultancy, um, if we didn't have the budget for research, I decided I would go out and do it myself. I quickly learned that was a recipe to get burnt out, and I decided to go and be a researcher full time. So working in Silicon Valley at the early stages of this career as a researcher, research was a really hot topic, so I thought, well, this is perfect for me. I'm not going to have to convince people of the power of research. Um, but I actually quickly learned that while a lot of companies say they're human-centered because it can help you become the next big thing, um, research didn't always hold that much weight within the companies that occupied Silicon Valley. And um, I was noticing that a lot of people were using personas, which a few people have already touched on today. So, for those of you that aren't familiar with personas, um, this is an example of one. Um, a persona would have an image of the person or a drawing of them. It would have a fake name, like Grandma Anna. And a few facts about them. You'd get to hear their story, what their goals are in life and their needs, and of course, their tech levels. So, um, as I was getting more and more into research, I was seeing that personas were starting to be used everywhere, most commonly with user stories. And the user story is a statement about a persona that describes their wants from a product. And this is meant to help your team develop the product around. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was that personas weren't just being used with user stories. They were an extra bit of information that was showing up in things like journey maps. They would accompany a presentation of behavioral analysis. Really. Um, they were very commonly used in most research presentations to help ground insights. And what I thought was interesting that, was that this wasn't just the fallback methodology for researchers to be using, but it's what makers were actually asking for as well. And I thought this was really curious because no matter how hard I tried, I always ran into some, into some consistent problems um, in using personas. So, the first is that they can make it really difficult um, to get people to believe in, that the, uh, in the power that research can play in driving innovation. So if you have something like a fake name or a tacked on age, that can actually make your team question the facts uh, behind the research itself. The second is that they include a lot of fluffy information. So it can be really hard for your team to understand what's actually relevant to their product. And then, the last is that all of that information can make it really hard to use. It can leave your team questioning, how can I actually take action on this? 
So that means the research that you've worked so hard on can actually just fall flat on its face. <laughs> so through many trials and errors, I realized that research really needed to be stripped down of anything that wasn't completely relevant to the project, so that it could be believable, if it was concise, it could be easy to use and easy to understand with no wiggle room for misinterpretation. So I went out searching uh, for a research methodology that would help me turn research skeptics into research lovers. And as I did so, I actually realized that my peers had been doing so for quite some time. So for those of you that don't know, personas were developed um, in the early 1980s and they gained a lot of traction um, in the 1990s and early 2000s. It wasn't until 2007 that UX idols like Jason Fried and Dan Safer started to move away pr from personas, noting that they were abstract and artificial. By the end of 2013, personas had actually gained a reputation for being BS, and I noticed that a lot of peers were out looking for other res uh, research methodologies just like me. And everyone was talking about this methodology called Jobs to be Done. Now, it's got a really interesting idea behind it. Um, it's basically founded uh, around the idea that your customers are hiring your product to get a specific job done. Pretty intrigued by that, I went out and did some more research. So, personas are um, centered around that, uh, looking at customer attributes, whereas Jobs to be Done is centered around looking at customer motivations. So in the case of Grandma Anna, you'd get to know her age, her occupation, and the fact that she likes uh, hobbies like baking and puzzles. Whereas in Jobs to be Done, you would be looking at her motivations. So you would find that Grandma Anna is actually looking for activities that regularly challenge her mentally. So looking at customer motivations rather than attributes made it really obvious how you could improve or iterate on a product. And that in itself made it seem like the obvious methodology to be using over um, personas. But in my research, it, the methodology had been around for 25 years, and it seemingly hadn't gotten that much traction. So um, I was I left wondering why were personas winning. Um, in my research, I kept coming across use cases about milkshakes and mattresses. As someone who spent most of their career in consumer electronics and software, these use cases were abstract, to say the least. Um, and I thought, maybe that's where my peers are getting hung up on. But still, I really loved the core idea um, behind the methodology to look at customer motivations, and I'm pretty determined, so I just kept <laughs> looking for more and more information on the methodology. Um, in the process, I came across a startup called Intercom, and they were actively using this research methodology to make innovative software-only products. So I decided to take a chance. I packed up my bags, and I moved from sunny California to rainy Ireland, and <laughs> I was quite hopeful that uh, jobs to be done would be the methodology that I was looking for. So when I joined Intercom, I jumped into Jobs to be Done with open arms, and at first, it was definitely everything that I wanted it to be. It was stripped of irrelevant information, so it was believable. Um, job stories, which are your core insights, uh, were concise, so they were easy for the team to understand. No one was, a, was really misinterpreting them, and they were really easy for people to continually reference um, during the product development process. But like all good things, um, we've definitely run into some trouble in using the technique. There are situations where we're working with assumptive job stories, so we're actually not sure, we, ha we haven't gone out and validated them. Sometimes we do big projects and we end up with way too many job stories. Um, and sometimes uh, we do smaller projects where we end up hearing really, really granular job stories. Um, but the best thing about the job speed done technique is that it isn't a rigid one. So, uh, what we found at Intercom is that you're actually able to combine the technique with other methodologies in your toolkit, and this has been able to solve most of the problems for us. So that's a little bit about my journey of how I um, came to find jobs to be done really useful and uh, have become a big advocate for it. So now I just want to tell you a little bit about what the methodology is. So it's a technique that focuses on your customers' motivations, uh, situations, and anxieties. And focusing on these things will help you unearth your customers' uh, real frustrations around using your product. And this will let you build a new product or feature from scratch. So the key point of the methodology is to focus on motivations. Um, the technique was actually founded in 1991 by Tony Olwick. Um, he now lives in SF, and he runs a consulting firm called Stratagen, where they actively use the technique. Uh, shortly after 
uh, Ulwick developed the technique, he got connected to Clay Christensen of Harvard Business School, who has since become a huge advocate. He's actually the guy that talks a lot about mattresses and milkshakes. Uh, his talks are really useful, so I would definitely suggest uh, watching some of them. And then later on, Bob Mosta of the Rewired Group um, discovered the technique, and he's since come to help companies like Intercom figure out how they can adapt the technique and use it themselves. I'm gonna keep coming back to this idea that the jobs to be done technique is adaptable because a lot of people have approached me about having problems using it. So it's important to keep in mind that when you go out and try it yourself, that if it's not quite working, um, you can adapt it. And if you guys actually go out and look at how um, Ulwick, Christensen, and Mosta use the technique, they're all gonna use it in a slightly different way. So don't get put off by that. So um, while Ulwick was the founder of the technique, you might say that the inspiration for the technique actually came from this quote by Theodore Levitt in 1960. People don't want a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. So the idea is that if you understand the motivations behind your customer's purchasing decisions, how to improve your product becomes really obvious. So in this case, uh, you wouldn't design what your customers say they want, which is a quarter inch drill, you'd be able to point out an opportunity to make an innovative product that could give your customers what they need, which is a quarter inch hole. So I'm gonna walk you through a pretty inspiring use case um, led by Tony Olwick. In 1991, he was working um, with the Cordis Corporation to help them reinvent their line of angioplasty balloon products. And he started out by do, uh, in doing this by interviewing interventional cardiologists. So these are the target users of these angioplasty balloon products. He got them to talk about their processes and their procedures and break them down, including listing important success metrics. So whatever made the procedure successful. Um, and by doing this, he was able to develop 75 unique uh, statements fo focused on desired outcomes. And uh, in this case, the desired outcomes were all oriented around these success metrics that the cardiologists talked about. So by doing this, uh, Olick was able to really help the Cordis Corporation understand what the cardiologists needed from these angioplasty balloon products. But still, 75 statements, that's a lot to take in from a research project. And Olick knew that, so he went out and did some quantitative research to better understand which of these markets were actually underserved. And with this combination of qualitative and quantitative research, Olick was able to um, facilitate strategy sessions with the Cordis Corporation. So this ultimately led to the invention of 19 new angioplasty balloon products. And with innovative thinking and some marketing that repositioned the products around these cardiologist needs statements, um, each product was able to become number one to two in the market. So at the time, Olick was calling these uh, statements desired outcomes, but they were so successful that they later came to form the foundation of the jobs to be done technique. This was actually the first time that Olick tried it out. Um, but if you fast forward uh, 25 years, invention looks quite different. There's definitely a lot of cool stuff happening in hardware, but because we're all focused on software here today, um, I'm gonna talk about how uh, we've used jobs to be done in a really lightweight way at Intercom. So if you have any hesitancies about trying out the technique, or perhaps you don't have a researcher on your team, this is a great way that you can try it out yourself. So we had a product in Intercom where you could generate a map of your users. And to be honest, it really wasn't that efficient in finding uh, the information you needed about your, your users. In fact, the um, panel on the left-hand side here that you can see was actually a much more effective and efficient way at finding the information you needed. But still, we could see um, that the product was getting a lot of traction, and we couldn't really figure out why. So we wanted to look at the problem through the lens of jobs to be done. And rather than going out and doing a big exhaustive research project, we just decided to simply observe what customers were doing. And when we were doing this, we were looking at our customers' motivations. And we noticed that customers were using this product for a very specific job. They wanted to impress people, whether that be at an expo, whether they'd be investors, or whether they'd just be people on Twitter. And this actually made us realize that customers weren't buying what we thought we were selling. So we thought we were selling them a map, but we were actually selling them a showpiece. And that pointed out a really great opportunity for us. Uh, we could really simply see that we could make something new. Rather than designing a better map, we would design a showpiece map. And as you can see here, the implications for doing that are actually quite different. So jobs to be done let us innovate, and this is what we ended up with. We had a super simple map 
that hid all sensitive customer data by default and was really easy to share. And after we released it, um, the feature started to take off. In fact, our customers were using it more than they had in the first place, and it was really starting to be shared everywhere. So by using jobs to be done, it pointed out an opportunity for us to innovate, and that was ultimately really successful for us. So hopefully you guys can kind of see the power of jobs to be done and um, are getting excited about using it, but I know a lot of people are quite attached to personas, so I just want to talk a little bit about the difference uh, between using jobs to be done and using personas. I'm going to do that by talking about a, a software game called Two Dots, and for those of you that don't know Two Dots, um, it's a game that follows these dots you see on the screen um, through a journey. And it's a simple pattern matching game that looks like this. Um, and as the two dots adventure through their various terrains, um, the game gets more and more difficult. So like most software products, Two Dots has a really diverse user base. And um, that means in the instance of using um, personas versus jobs to be done, you'll be looking at using multiple personas versus multiple jobs to be done. So let's start off by talking about um, personas and see if we can figure out why some of the users of Two Dots uh, play the game. So if we're going to use personas, we're going to be using user stories. And again, this is uh, meant to help a team develop a uh, product around. So a user story goes like this. As a persona, I want to take an action so that I can have an expected outcome. So even though um, there would be more than two personas, I want to make this easy on us. And let's just take a look at two personas. Let's take a look at Grandma Anna, who we met earlier, and Just Jack. Um, so I want to just look through these. So we have two sets of personas and uh, two sets of user stories. And I want to point out some of the problems here. So the first problem is that there's a lot of information here. And so much so that as a presenter, I'm not really sure where to start in explaining all of this information to you. So I'm going to just simply read the user stories to you. Grandma Anna's would be, as a 62-year-old grandma named Anna, I want to play a game on my iPad so that I don't get bored in my free time. Whereas just Jack's would be, as a 29-year-old marketer named Jack, I want to play a game on my iPhone so that I don't get bored on the bus. And this leads me to my next point. When you actually look through all this information, there's not a lot of relevant information. So this leaves your team trying to piece together how they can use this information to help develop the product. And the last bit is that there's actually not a lot of consistent information. So when you're using multiple personas, you're trying to understand uh, where they overlap so that you can help invent a product around that. And in this case, there's not actually that much useful information. In fact, there's only three pieces of information highlighted. So this can leave your, question, your team questioning not only how to act on the information, but it can leave your team questioning the information altogether, because not that much of it is relevant to the project. So let's take a look at the user story one more time and see what's not working. So if you take the user story as your core insight that you're using with personas, there's three parts to it. And you can see that actually a third of it isn't relevant. So telling someone a persona's name and age isn't actually going to help you create an innovative product. The second bit is that if you look at the action, um, it's making too many assumptions. So if we assume that um, we need to develop what customers say they want, we can't actually be sure that that's what they need. So ultimately, personas are meant to help your audience empathize um, with the end user and help your team develop an empathetic product, but it can actually derail your research. So now I want to compare this to a job story, um, the structure of that that we use at Intercom. So job stories get straight to the point, and they um, strip out any irrelevant information. So the structure that we use that's been really successful for this is when, the situation I'm in, I want to, the motivation, so that I can, the expected outcome. So let's take a look at Grandma Anna and Just Jack's uh, job stories. So Grandma Anna's would be, when my granddaughter is napping, I want to do something that will challenge me mentally so that I can stay sharp and improve my memory. Whereas Just Jack's would be, when I'm sitting on a bus with nothing to do, I want to do something that will challenge me mentally so that I can stay sharp and improve my memory. So while the situations are slightly different, you can actually see that the motivations and expected outcomes are the same, even though Grandma Anna and Just Jack are really different people. And if you take a look at the situations, you can actually see an opportunity to create a more generalized job story that would be when I have a bit of free time. So just like that, 
your two dots team can understand why Grandma Anna and just Jack are playing two dots. It's not because they're bored, it's because they want a mental challenge. And understanding how to improve the product becomes really obvious then. So ultimately, looking at personas didn't really explain why Grandma Anna and Just Jack played two dots, but Jobs to be Done did. So hopefully you guys can see the power of the technique now, um, and I want to talk you through a little bit about how you guys can use this yourself. So I know a lot of you have heard about the technique, and if you were like me and you went out and looked for information on it, you might have found a lot of information on hardware products or milkshakes. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about this um, in the lens of two dots again so that we can learn about how to use um, jobs to be done for software development. So if you want to use the technique, you can follow a really simple process. Um, the first thing you're going to do is look to identify high-level jobs. Um, after that, you're going to identify sub-jobs, all of which map back to this one high-level job. Once you have this set of information, you're ready to go out and observe how people are doing it today and conduct jobs to be done interviews with those people. Um, those interviews will set you up to get all the information you need to write job stories, which will in turn help your team uh, develop solutions. So let's walk through this process step by step. Um, the best place to start when you're identifying uh, the high level job is with quantitative data. So at any software company, you're gonna be getting a lot of information um, and feedback coming in from your customers. So in the case of two dots, you might get people saying, I want tutorials, or I want time limits on my game, or help me on hard levels. So if you analyze enough conversations, you'll start to see these really high-level patterns emerging. And these high-level patterns are gonna become your high-level jobs. Uh, so in the case of two dots, um, you would end up with a, a, a hit list of feature requests that would so it looks something like this. You might see tutorials, customizability, adding game constraints, and multiplayer games. Now, if you're to look at just one of these high-level themes, you'll actually see that it has multiple facets to it. And these are where their sub-jobs come from. So in this case, for tutorials, you would have how-tos, hints, tooltips, and descriptive legends. So once you have this amount of information, that's when you want to go out and start interviewing people. And this is what you're going to develop your script around. So now it's time to start with jobs to be done interviews. Uh, so the goals of jobs to be done interview are slightly different than those of other research projects. At Intercom, we're asking questions like, why do people hire a product? Do we need to iterate or innovate? Uh, what are our customers' motivations behind using our product? And how can we make sure that no one switches away? So to an answer these questions, we look at jobs to be done interviews, which have three core elements. There's the first thought, the timeline, and the four forces. So the first thought is really crucial. It's actually the moment that your customer um, thinks about switching away from your product or the old product. Um, and you'll find that once you're able to abstract, uh, um, extract the first thought, that your customer's memories of the entire purchasing process will start to just flood back to them. And that's gonna be really important because it's what's gonna help you populate your timeline. So the timeline is a tool that the Rewired group came up with that we found particularly useful at Intercom. So it'll look something like this. It'll start with the first thought, and then um, you'll note all of these events that are causing passive looking, active looking, um, deciding, and consuming. So uh, getting insights on all this information will actually, actually help you uncover your customer's uh, consideration set. And this is what's most important to them when they're looking for a new product. The last bit of the interview is focused on the four forces. So this is going to help you understand why your customers want to switch. So um, this falls into two buckets. There is reasons to switch, which focus on problems with the current product and attractions of the new product. And then there's reasons to say. So there's anxieties your customers are experiencing around switching. And you'll start to understand allegiances to the old product. And these insights are so helpful because they'll help you understand what's most important to your customers when they're using your product and what will ultimately help, them, um, help get them to switch to a new product. So now that you understand um, kind of what you're looking for in the Jobs to be Done interviews, you might want to go out and see, find a script <laughs> that um, could help you develop your own. But again, you're going to find information on milkshakes and mattresses. And you might start to find that you're seeing a lot of questions like this. What time of year was it? And what was the weather like when you went to buy the product? And was anyone else with you at the time? And these questions seem 
a little strange, and when you ask them to people using a software product, uh, it kind of leaves them questioning why you're talking to them all together. Um, but these questions are actually aimed at helping you uncover the first thought. And the reason they're asked this way is that um, it's supposed to help uh, emotionally trigger your participants. The idea is that once they start to remember things that were more important to them at the time, then the, um, all of the ideas behind their purchasing decisions start to come back to them. So it's actually a really clever technique, but for someone that works in a B2B software product, we've actually realized that our customers don't have that much emotional attachment to our products, much to our dismay. So we've decided that rather than focusing on our customers' emotional triggers, um, we would actually focus on the functional aspects of the company. So rather than asking questions about the weather, we started asking questions like, what tool were you using when you started looking? And tell me about the old solution. Can you remember how well it was working? Or was anyone else involved in the purchasing decision? And these have actually proved to be really successful for us. So we just ended up tweaking the technique. And again, if those questions aren't working for you, that's a really great thing to start experimenting with to see how you can start to extract that first thought. But ultimately, these questions helped us uncover our customers' motivations, um, situations, and anxieties. Um, and that ultimately would help us write the job story. So I'm going to go over the structure of the job story one more time. Again, it gets rid of any irrelevant information. Um, and you'll use all the insights from your research to start filling in job stories that follow the structure of when I'm, the situation, I want to, the motivation, so that I can, the expected outcome. And these have worked really well for us at Intercom. So they're super believable because they're only based on information that we found from the research. Um, they're concise, so they're really easy for people to understand. And um, that makes it really easy to continually reference throughout product development process. My favorite thing about job stories, actually, has been that they can become standalone artifacts. So Intercom, we only have three researchers, and uh, that means that we all work on multiple teams. And that means that in important things like design crits, I can't always be there to defend my research, but a job story can. And the amazing thing that I found at Intercom is that um, Designers and PMs are constantly going back to reference job stories. So they're constantly um, seeing if the product they're developing is going to get the job story done. Um, and they also make their way into all of our design crits. So whenever we're developing a product or feature, um, our VP of product and our design director can see um, the rationale. And just like that, um, developing solutions become really, becomes really easy. So in the case of the two dots job story, the team knows that they need to make games that are more mentally challenging, but they are also short enough that they fit into small pockets of time. So um, now I just want to end by talking a little bit about uh, where jobs to be done goes awry. Because since I've joined Intercom, I get a lot of questions about uh, how the technique doesn't necessarily work for some people, uh, like Danny had mentioned. So I get questions like, what should I do when I have too many job stories? Or what should I do when my job stories are too granular? Or what should I do when my job stories aren't validated? So like I mentioned earlier, um, you just need to, you can adapt the technique. It's not a rigid technique. So if the questions that you're asking aren't working for you, um, try to adapt them a little bit so that you can um, figure out how you can start to extract your customers' first thoughts. And if you end up with uh, too much information uh, or non-validated information, just start to combine the technique with other research methodologies. So I'm going to show you um, an example of something that we went through at Intercom recently. Um, and I, I just want to let you know I've abstracted some of the images because the project is still ongoing. So some of the data is still sensitive. Um, we did a research project early in the year, and it was quite a big one. We wanted to develop um, a pretty big feature. And we ended up in a situation where we had way too many job stories. So we had a lot of insights and felt that they were all really important, um, but we weren't sure how we were going to make sense of this to our team. And to make matters more complicated, um, the, <laughs> the insights around, or the job stories actually spanned multiple Intercom products. So at Intercom, we have three products, and the job stories were related to many of those products. So, um, when we finished the project, we had four high-level jobs, and we had a bunch of sub-jobs for each of those high-level jobs. And um, as you can see here, we actually had so many sub-jobs that we had a poster board full of sub-jobs per high-level job. And uh, we walked away from this project saying, like, 
all of these sub-jobs are really, really important to share. So our job is now to figure out what's the best way to share this with our team. Um, and as we were writing out the sub-jobs, we actually started to notice this circular pattern emerging. So our customers were looking for a what, and they were looking for a why, and then it would go back to the what and the why. And since we already had all of our um, job stories written out on Post-its, we decided the perfect tool to help us organize these job stories would be an affinity diagram. So um, we started by uh, mapping the Post-its to um, one axis as the high-level jobs. And then we started to map them to this what and why process that we uh, noticed was emerging. And what was really great here um, was that as we were doing this, we actually started to notice a more granular process. Um, so our customers weren't just looking at the what and the why, they were exploring. They were then identifying, defining, sharing, and comparing. And this was really great because it defined the level of granularity of information that we wanted to share with our team. So for each step in the process, we would be able to share four sub-jobs that map back to the high-level job. And um, organizing the information in this way was really great because for people that weren't on the product um, that were showing up to things like design crits, um, we could share this level of information with them. We know that across multiple intercom products, uh, for this feature, our customers need to get this process done. They need to explore, they need to identify, define, share, and compare. So that was really great for anyone that wasn't directly working on the project. But for people that were on the project, this is the amount of information we wanted to share with them. And still, it does seem like a lot, but when we were able to break this down by a process, we were able to take, talk about what does explore mean, and then we were able to talk about um, what jobs people were trying to get done in these different situations. And what was really great about this is that we could isolate one step in this process. So if we wanted to start designing just for the explore step, we could isolate four of these sub-jobs, go out and design something, and then check the product development back against all those jobs. And that could ensure that even though this feature was going to span multiple pro uh, products, that we could still make sure that we were satisfying the needs of our customers. So ultimately that meant that affinity diagrams helped us organize our job stories in a better way, and that was really successful for our product development process. So that's a pretty simple use case, um, and you might be wondering how else can I combine jobs to be done with other methodologies. So I'm just gonna quickly talk you through um, a few ideas and things that we do at Intercom or things that we've heard other people do. Um, so if you wanna narrow down your job stories, um, you probably want to be able to prioritize them. So like Ulwick did um, with the Cordis Corporation, you can go out and use surveys or quantitative data to understand which market is most underserved and therefore which um, jobs for developing around are gonna have the biggest impact at your company. While you're interviewing your customers, you can actually get them to stack rank the job stories so you can start to understand which jobs are most important to my customers and therefore which ones are gonna have the biggest impact if we start to develop. Um, or you can look at behavioral analysis. You can see which jobs are my customers trying to do the most and therefore which ones are gonna help them the most if we develop around them first. Um, so if you wanna validate your job stories, let's say you're working with assumptive job stories, which is something that's gonna happen a lot, especially if you don't always have a researcher on your team, um, the best thing to do is to research them and I think that's something that designers can do as well. So ideally, um, you'd be doing a jobs to be done interview. Um, so what you would do is put the assumptive job stories to the side, go out and um, do your jobs to be done interviews and develop your um, validated job stories. Then you compare those to assumptive ones and see if they need to change. We've actually had situations at Intercom where the assumptive job stories are spot on. We've had some where they're actually pretty far off. So um, it just comes down to a matter of what, how much you need to update your team. Um, but often uh, in software we move really fast and that means that we can't wait on <laughs> research for our product development. So what we've done at Intercom is that we've actually combined um, jobs to be done interviews and concept testing. So um, this means that your team can start designing around these assumptive job stories and before you get into actual prototyping, um, just make sure that you have some time set up to um, interview your customers. So the first half of the interview is gonna be a jobs to be done interview where you can validate or invalidate those assumptive job stories. And the second half of it will be concept testing. And that will immediately tell you if 
um, the products that you're developing are on track to meet the needs of your customers. So that's actually been a really successful technique for us. And uh, it also ensures that research isn't a roadblock, which is something that's really important to us. And then the last thing is if you want to organize your job stories, let's say you have gotten a lot of job stories, but you think that they're all super important, um, the best thing to do is organize them. And this will help you either define a process or prioritize them and tell you what's most important to focus on first. So um, remember when you're using the technique that when you're in doubt, just combine it with other techniques. Um, what I've talked about today is just a short snippet of uh, what you can actually do. And uh, if you guys go out and try this yourself, I'd be really curious to hear how you start to combine job stories. Um, and the last bit is don't forget that you can always ad adapt the technique. So I think the questions that we've developed at Intercom have been a really great start, but we mostly focus on B2B software. So um, if you're in a different situation, like you're doing service design or industrial design or um, you're a B2C software company, you might find that you do need to continue to adapt those questions. Um, but ultimately, the technique uh, proves to be really successful and, uh, in my experience, much more successful than personas. Looking at customer motivations, situations, and anxieties rather than attributes can ultimately help you figure out how you want to innovate your product. And my favorite part is that it helps take research skeptics to being research lovers. Um, so that's all I have for you today, but if you guys are curious and inspired to learn more about jobs to be done, um, you should go to Intercom's blog. We have a free book on jobs to be done. Um, you can also go um, to the Rewired group uh, because they have a lot of useful information on the subject as well. So thank you so much.